Let's go ahead. Um, so today we're going to talk about industry data standards, and we've got a bunch of folks lined up to share um, projects that they're working on. Uh, Billy, Dan, Joe, Scott, Suja, and Dave will all be sharing. And I'm pretty excited about this topic. I think that we, um, our industry is ripe to take advantage of uh, more data standards. And I'm gonna keep the introduction short and let these guys jump in and share what they're working on because I think that's really a lot more exciting than um, my overview of data standards. But I think data standards um, are you know, an agreement for a group of people to work together to do something in a similar way. And that allows us to then build all sorts of cool stuff and to take things in directions that we don't anticipate and to build tools and find tools that other people have used. And, I think that, you know, that's really exciting and I'm um, totally on board with trying to do more and more. So the purpose of this session is to introduce a few different standards to you guys, um, get you excited about data standards, get you thinking about um, ways that we can um, use these in our industry and uh, how we can make them better. So um, we'll go in the order here of the presentations um, and I'll let you guys introduce yourself uh, when you start your presentation. Just you know, give a quick couple second overview on um, you know who you are and what you're doing. I um, I'm Ben Stabler with RSG. I kind of skipped that because I got a little behind on the technology uh, setup. But um, I think we have a great set of speakers, and we'll talk through these things about half hour. We're shooting for about a half hour, um, and then we have an hour after that to talk through some questions and uh, hopefully get a good discussion going. So with that. Um, I think next up is Open Matrix, which is Billy and Dan. That's right. And uh, I guess I will be uh, presenting at the beginning. So I will share my screen. Do you have to unshare yours or can I just go boom? Let's just go boom. There we go. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. Yes. That's great. Great. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I am Billy Charlton. I'm currently a, a researcher at the Technische Universität here in Berlin, Germany. Uh, I've been here for a couple of years, and before I moved to Germany, I was living on the West Coast doing modeling for the Puget Sound Regional Council in Seattle, and before that, at uh, the San Francisco County Transportation Authority. Now, at both of those uh, agencies, uh, we recognized uh, that there was a gap in um, in the travel modeling field that I'm gonna talk about right now. Now, I only have five minutes according to Ben, so I'm gonna go over this really, really quickly. And the idea is that we can save lots of interesting discussion uh, afterwards. So I'm just gonna get into it. So what is OMX? And so the open matrix specification is a common data specification for storing and transferring transport matrix data. Uh, all the models that we're using uh, have made, they use matrix data like all over the place. So skim tables, trip tables. Uh, and what we recognized was that there was a need for something that was portable 
accessible and open for interoperability. But OMX is more than just the data specification itself. It is also a set of APIs for all of the programming languages uh, that we as modelers use. So uh, Python, R, C Sharp, C++, Java, I think there's some others as well. Uh, and not only does OMX have APIs for those languages, but it also is supported uh, by many of the commercial software vendors in our community. Um, the OMX itself is community maintained. Uh, there's no owner of OMX. It's not supported by any, uh, you know, uh, it's not created by any corporate sponsor other than that it's a part of under the Zephyr umbrella. Uh, and when we started it back in 2013, we did intend it to be some sort of an industry standard standard, but it isn't a standard the way that official standards are, you know, approved uh, and then enforced by some governing body. Uh, right now, it really is a data specification. Um, so uh, we all have matrix data. Uh, how can OMX help you uh, with your model? Well, also, uh, we modelers all like to transfer matrix data between modeling tools, uh, and OMX provides a common interchange format for that purpose. So uh, it includes useful facilities addressing things like your TAZ, your traffic analysis zone numbering scheme, uh, the shape of the matrices. Uh, it handles null values very well, and the files can also be compressed, so they don't take up enormous amounts of disk space. The idea is that if there's enough support for OMX, this specification may become a de facto standard, really, even without a standards body um, giving it the stamp of approval, um, although that is something that Zephyr is talking about. So the question is, are we there yet? Like, have, uh, Do we have enough uh, industry support for it? Uh, the OMX specification itself is actually quite detailed. Uh, it uses a, a technology called HDF5, uh, which we didn't create. It's a scientific um, sort of container format that physicists use in, for particles, particle accelerators and the like. It's uh, quite complex uh, and it includes the data, the shape. You can have multiple matrices in one OMX file. Uh, there's version tracking and things like zone lookups. So uh, quite a lot of work and thought went into the specification itself. Uh, and we looked at uh, many different um, uh, application cases and interviewed lots of people who were uh, who would be using this type of, uh, of file. So one of the interesting things is that the, uh, we started this in 2013. Uh, the version one came out uh, um, through the community-based process a couple of years after that. And uh, we got several of the different commercial vendors involved. Uh, and uh, we got great support from the, the main vendors of travel forecasting software. But one thing that was missing that we realized uh, much later in the process was that uh, it was very easy to get people to say, yes, we support OMX and our software now supports it. Um, but how do you verify that that support actually works? And so uh, here this question of if you start with an OMX file and then you create it in tool A and then try to read it or modify it in tool B and then save it and send it to another agency that is using tool C, is it still an OMX file at the end of that process? Uh, and there was no way to independently validate each of those tools. Uh, and so the final piece of the puzzle uh, was creating what is now called the OMX validator. And so this is, uh, there's two ways to validate an OMX file. Uh, one is to uh, run a script that's written in Python uh, that goes through many different tests. And the other is there's actually an online OMX validator notebook where you can upload your file uh, to uh, the web, and then the tests will be run uh, for you, and then you'll get like a green check mark uh, or you know a big red X. And there are twelve different checks that are run uh, to determine whether the file passes or fails as um, as an OMX file. I'm already at four minutes, uh, actually almost five. So uh, with that, I'll give you a moment here to take a screenshot of these different links, uh, saying that if you want to see more. Uh, the wiki is really the best place to start, and there's lots of documentation, and here's the link for the, for the validator itself as well. Uh, and if you look on that homepage of the wiki, you will see that there is a lot of information in terms of the different APIs that are available for the different languages, and also the different uh, commercial vendors who are supporting it. Um, I'm the one speaking today, but this is really a group effort. A lot of men and women were involved in putting this together. Uh, I was speaking to uh, Ben earlier today, and also Dan Florian from INRO 
uh, who was really driving a lot of this omics validator work. And I think we're out of time right now, uh, but I do uh, want to make sure that we have time in the discussion afterwards to talk about how important it is to have the validation step as the final piece to determine whether or not this thing truly is you know, standard when you call it a standard. So with that, uh, I will cede the floor uh, with uh, one XKCD thing where you think there's too many different file types. Let's create one more file type and that's going to solve the problem. That is exactly what we've done. Uh, and we do hope that this is uh, going to be a solution for the future. So with that, thank you for your time. Thank you, Billy. Minutes, Billy. Not too bad. Yeah, thank you. Um, one other quick plug, and we'll maybe Dave can talk when we get to the Q&A about the Zephyr software badging exercise to kind of brand and help build good tools. OMX, and that, that actually, that effort helped spawn the validator to exercise too, I think. So let's, let's try to bring that back, Dave, when, when we get to Q&A. Yeah, these things are definitely related. I, I see that absolutely, yeah. All right. And sorry, Dan, I took the last minute. I was hoping I was going to pass the baton to you. We'll, we'll, bring, you in we'll bring you in later. OK, on to the next one. So Scott and Joe, um, you're up. I think you might be on mute, Joe. Or, well, now you're on mute, but we can't hear you. We can't hear you. We couldn't hear you before. <laughs> We can't hear anything. Someone else from the team able to speak to the slides, perhaps, while Joe tries to uh, fix his mic? This, this is Scott. I think I just unmuted myself. We can hear you, Scott. Yep. Okay. We can see your chat, Joe, but we can't hear you. You guys want to switch it up, maybe? Uh, can you um, hear me? Oh, we can hear yeah, Joe now. He's on. All right, great. Take it away. All right, yeah. So I'll I'll give a little bit of an introduction. I, I'll and I'll I'll try and make it brief. Um, uh, so we're going to talk about the general modeling network specification, um, GMNS, uh, which is something that we've had a bunch of people working on. Uh, Scott, maybe if you could advance to the next slide. Um, you know, the GMNS was. Um, the objective of the project is really to, to, to provide a, a kind of a, a data sharing, a network data sharing specification um, uh, that, that does have some, you know, kind of basic requirements um, uh, that it is, you know, things like human readable, extensible, um, that it represents kind of um, physical infrastructure as well as services. Um, it's intended to really be able to support uh, a whole range of um, both multi-resolution and multimodal uh, network um, assignment and, and other tools. You know, it was really motivated um, by a couple different things and, and with some kind of overarching goals. One uh, was that there had been a bunch of work that was done as part of the Sharp 2 uh, C10 project uh, that was looking at, you know, integration of uh, advanced dynamic assignment models and activity-based demand models um, and that there were some kind of challenges around that um, uh, and kind of at the same time Zephyr had been um, launching some efforts to initiate or some initiatives and one of them was around um, network data standards and, and management tools and you know something that uh, I think both Ben and uh, Billy have alluded to is this idea that um, by establishing these standards, they, they really allow us to kind of, um, you know, uh, do new things uh, to provide means to collaborate um, and ideally really to kind of lower barriers and kind of costs to entry and, and exploration. And of course, with all of the different network packages out there, uh, each one with its own kind of bespoke format, it makes it uh, very difficult and, and very almost cost prohibitive to try and actually evaluate how different tools might work. Um, because there is this this great cost to try and even develop the networks, and so this hopes to the, the goal of one of the goals of GMNS is to kind of lower that barrier to entry. So Scott, if you could advance to the next tool, uh, the next um, slide rather, please. 
um, I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, you know, how we've been kind of managing the project and a little bit of where we are. And then Scott will give you kind of a, a brief overview of some of the high level details. Um, we actually, it, the project is being overseen by this uh, project management group um, that is a, a mix of, of both um, industry folks, um, uh, you know, uh, public sector employees at the federal level, the MPO level, the county level. Um, and and academic researchers researchers as well, um, and you can see uh, the the folks who have been participating here. We've also uh, been fortunate enough to have a bunch of other folks uh, participating in the project well as well who aren't officially part of the project management group, but but have been contributing. Um, what we did was we've been meeting for about I want to say like a year and a half now. Um, mm -hmm. I want to say approximately monthly. Uh, sometimes we go a little bit longer. And the process that we've gone through is really to define some high level kind of requirements of it, um, uh, then to develop an initial version, um, uh, which is presently 0 0.85, um, to develop some initial test cases, um, and then to begin to kind of develop some of the support tools that include things like uh, conversion and validation. And I should also say we've been fortunate enough to have, you know, other contributors like uh, Shushong Zhu, who's not listed here, uh, who has taken and run with it and, and actually now provided the ability to use tools that he's developed like Nexta and DTA Lite to kind of read and assign using uh, the network packages. And so I want to hand it over now to Scott and talk a little bit more about the, the details of the specification. Okay. Hey, thank you, Joe. Uh, so high level, one of the first things the project management committee worked out was the high level requirements. Uh, first, we're primarily focused on data, not software, although we have developed a little bit of software to exercise the specification. Um, and the idea is, again, of the multi-resolution flavor of what we're doing is extensible, not universal. In other words, we have a very base specification, a simple directed link and node structure, which anybody should be able to have data for. Uh, from the outset, it was multimodal, but then a whole bunch of extensions going down to traffic signals that you that you need to support more dynamic networks. And reflecting infrastructure, services, and policies, where you know, we're always starting with what's physically down on the ground, uh, the physical road, but then you've got services and you know the traffic the controls and the like, but then you've got different services, you have different policies such as tolls and lane use restrictions um, that need to be modeled. And finally, it's human readable. Right now we're using comma separated fields, a very simple text tabular format, um, and but you know, it's still a little bit of an open question. You know, I should I should say as we're going, I'd say we're now at about version 0 0.85. In my next slide, I'll talk. So it's not, not as mature as some of the other things you'll be hearing about today. Still very much a work in progress. Um, but let me give a little bit of the timeline. Is I think it came of interest to Zephyr Transport from the Shark Tank at Planning Application 2017. And meanwhile, just about two years ago, uh, I was doing some work with Brian Cardner at Federal Highway on you know, what do we do with all the data and the network from the Sharp 2 C10 projects? And you know, we had a little bit of money and said, well, why don't we see about developing a, a nice way to represent these multi-resolution networks that also have a high degree of detail? Uh, so it was just about two years ago, as part of that project, I was doing some initial stakeholder outreach. I remember the meetings at ITM in Atlanta. Uh, and then it dawned on us, gosh, we have the same objectives here. Why don't we pool our efforts? Uh, so we came, efforts came together about a year and a half ago, setting up the PMC and working the requirements and continuing the development. So that's how these efforts merged. Um, and Build It Up had an initial public release at TRB last January. Uh, realized it wasn't done yet, but we also realized that the way to really make it better and make it into something really useful was to get some people to try to use it. 
you know, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. In order to have a good standard, people need to use it, but people won't use it unless it's good. Uh, so, um, but we're working on it and really have some gratitude to those who've dug into it, provided detailed comments, such as Elizabeth Soul and Michael Mahout, uh, and also Su Shangju, who's adding uh, GMNS connectors to Nexta, and Elizabeth's been also developing some co codes. So I'm just very grateful uh, to these members of the community who are beginning to contribute. Uh, so do I have time for a two minute tour? Uh, <laughs> we're, we're kind of running up at our end of our time. Maybe just a minute. Okay. One, maybe one more minute. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We can come back. Well, to I don't know. It, yeah, we can come back. I want to introduce my teammate, Ian Berg. I don't know if he's stuck on mute, but uh, he's uh, on the Volpe team here. Uh, came out of school in math and geography, which are just the right majors, and just been awesomely helpful to this to to, to developing uh, GMNS behind the scenes. Uh, and the one minute tour. Okay. So I just hopped over. Can is this at all visible to folks? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just all I'm going to point out here is yeah, we have a master branch, and again, since this is a work in progress, and we also have an updates branch, which is basically we're taking in the suggestions we received and then playing around with them in the updates branch and then eventually you know have the PMC approve and then you know do the pull request, move it over to the master. Uh, only other thing I would point out is you know the specification itself is in markdown files. And we also have a few tiny net tiny network examples including a wonderful multimodal road network just outside our office should we ever return there so thank you all right thank you so we'll definitely have time after the presentations to talk yeah. to you and yeah and give a little demo yeah okay next up um we're going to talk about open street map and gtfs yep all right, Suja, go ahead and take it away. Sure. Thanks, Ben. All right. Um, let me know if you guys can all see my screen. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Just around the slideshow. All right, great. Um, so, hi, everybody. Um, my name is CJ Wen, and I'm with WSP for um, a little more than four years now, um, and I'm based in New York. Um, so today, the standards I'm going to talk about is the network standards that we derived from OpenStreetMap, aka OSM, and General Transit Feed Specification, aka GTFS. Um, before I start, I'd like to give a shout out to those folks that are on the project with us. Um, they are Rachel Wicken with Met Council, Jonathan Ehrlich with Met Council, and Elizabeth Saw with Urban Labs, who's our on co-host today on the call. Um, and last but not least, Josie Kreschner was Intermex. So I'll be um, introducing you guys to the problem first and then followed by the solution that we proposed to Met Council and implemented for them. Um, so the problem is rather very uh, straightforward. So first, there is no commonly agreed upon sources for roadway and transit networks. Second, there's no commonly agreed upon and adopted network standards. Um, just think about it. Wouldn't it be great if we can all agree on and choose one source mm -hmm. for us to get a base railway or transit network? And then we can all agree on and develop a sort of network standard for the two so that any practice or any um, achievement that we make related to network build or network update or management can be like a shareable and collaborative process with the whole community. So it won't be an individual struggle anymore. If you agree with me, here's our proposed solution. So the solution one is for the roadway. We recommend using OpenStreetMap 
as the source for Railway, and then develop network standard based on that. For those who are not very familiar with OpenStreetMap, um, it is just a online collaborative geodatabase, which you can pull maps um, for your location, any location that you want. So the diagram here shows the important steps that we took to arrive at a network standard for Railway. We start with the OpenStreetMap and then extract the OSM geometries and attributes from them um, and do some cleaning and formatting activity to arrive at the proposed network standard, which only has the standard attributes such as um, the facility type, number of lanes, et cetera. And of course, most of the time, we would also have a lot of other GIS inputs that provide more details on the standard attributes. So we would also conflate all those information back into the network standard. So eventually, there will be only one place where all those information will be living in, which is our roadway network standard. And from there, um, we could do any sort of calculation for an MPO specific network with modeling attributes. Say it's either gonna be in Cube or ME or uh, TransCAD. The reason we choose OSM is because it's open source, it's a community's choice, and it's used by a lot of other um, much broader user bases such as um, Facebook, Craigslist, etc. And like those users have already built a lot of useful tools around it for the same tasks that we also wanted to achieve. So here's the example of the route that we took for Met Council. The tools that we used to fill in those gaps are uh, OSM and X and shared streets. So both of them are very good for extracting the OSM geometries and attributes from the server. And then OSM and X especially is good for developing a routable network, which you can get a shortest path from um, point A to B. And then when thinking about conflation, um, Shear Street is a very good candidate because it uh, can solve the alignment and um, match to of, of those additional geometry inputs to the OpenStreetMap geometry and assign them with a stable and shareable Shear Street ID for the joining of multiple databases to happen. With that being said, um, here's an example of the roadway network standard that we developed and implemented for the Met Council. So it consists of three parts, links, shapes, and nodes. The links file basically contains all the attributes of the facility, such as the name, the facility type, the lanes. Um, and then the shape file, it has the actual geometry of the link. And then the node file, it has the attributes and the geometry for the intersections. And then for these three files, they have a lot of IDs associated with it. So for the first group here, um, as I highlighted in red box, is the OpenStreetMap handles or OpenStreetMap IDs. They are used um, to link our network standard back to OSM database if, if needed for any like future updates or so, because OSM is frequently updated. And then the next group of IDs are the share street IDs, which is used for the conflation. And as I said before, this is the join key when we try to consolidate multiple geodatabases together. Moving on for our solution two, which is for the transit network, uh, we recommend using GTFS as the source for transit and then conflate and route the GTFS shapes to the road that previously introduced roadway network standard. So the diagram here is relatively simpler. We start with the GTFS and then route, conflate, reformat it into the transit standard, which is um, routed on top of the roadway standard. And then from there, uh, we can translate or write it out to any MPO specific network, transit network. So again, the tools that we used for routing and conflation is OSM and Next and Shared Streets. Um, I might go into details later, but for time savings, I'll just mention them here. Um, but one point I wanted to um, point it out is that um, aligning GTFS shapes to the roadway is something 
like many in our community do, but like it's not generally shared because of many reasons. One of them is that there's no commonly agreed or used roadway, based roadway. So if we choose a roadway network standard, it will help us to allow these methods be more easily shared. So here's an example of the uh, standard transit network that we developed for Met Council. Um, for those who are very familiar with GTFS, you can um, tell this is um, based on the shapes.txt from it, except for the last two columns, which stores the uh, conflation result uh, to the roadway network um, so that we can tell how this bus traverses on top of our roadway network standard. And as shown in the, in the example here in this chart, this is a bus traveling through the downtown Minneapolis on top of our roadway network standard. Um, with all being said, I'll conclude. Um, so the key takeaways that we wanted to deliver to you guys today is that first, um, we really need to um, think about and agree on a place where we can get the base railway and transit network. And we recommend OpenStreetMap and GTFS for this purpose. And then second, um, it's good for us to come up and finalize with a network standard. Um, it can be the one we proposed here, or it can be the GMNS proposed earlier. But anyway, with a network standard, we would be able to share any um, practices or any tools cool tools that we uh, develop based on any network tasks to the, with the whole community. So it will encourage more um, people to engage with this task. Um, and in fact, we've already um, started establishing a pipeline uh, to do those steps. So with all that being said, that's all for me. Um, I'm happy to discuss in more details. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Does 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 your standard have a pros have a name or something at this point? <laughs> um, it doesn't really have a formal name yet. We just call it uh, network standard. It's a good question. We need to think about a really fancy name. <laughs> okay, cool. We can come back to it. Just curious. All right. Um, I think our last presentation is Dave. Um, you're going to talk about projects card standard. All right, thanks, Ben. Thanks, everybody, for your time and attention today. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yes. All right. Um, so related to networks is an idea. So I think this is more in the idea stage, so maybe a proposed standard um, that we'd like to discuss with you, um, something we call project cards. So this, uh, like Siege's presentation, grew out of some work that uh, WSP did with Met Council. Um, and Elizabeth from Urban Labs and Josie were, were part of that. So thanks to, to Met Council for supporting uh, this initiative and allowing us to go in a, in a way that hopefully facilitates these standards. So the problem that we're trying to address is that when we use travel models for planning, we often need to edit <laughs> the roadway and transit networks. Um, to simulate infrastructure changes, um, which seems unobjectionable. Um, as a consultant, we often hear some of the challenges of, of those working in the public sector, and a very common challenge is that there's a number of existing network management solutions, um, but generally they're not uh, meeting the needs of our community. Um, we don't mean to say that any of them uh, are bad, or uh, we just, we hear this as a problem, often and uh, we're trying to maybe have a solution that's uh, that solves some of that problem. So some of the shortcomings we hear is they're not interoperable, you know, maybe they rely on the commercial software package that the travel model is using. Sometimes they're not readable. Uh, when you're coding projects it's nice to have non-technical people do that because it can be tedious um, and sometimes requires different domain expertise and modeling. And sometimes these solutions are built on multiple commercial software packages. So you may have a travel model software package paired with ArcGIS, which starts to become a somewhat cumbersome uh, technical bundle. So the proposed solution that we came up with um, 
was to create a network edit standard. So we wanted something that facilitated metadata, uh, something that could be, could be a standard, something that a human could read and also a, a computer could read. And um, we did take the extra step in of calling it something. So we called it a project card. I think for the network standard that uh, we put together that CJ described, we, we started a little bit uh, after GMNS did. So we hope it eventually merges with G GMNS. Well, I hope GMNS is renamed something that I can actually say. I was very impressed with how easily GMNS rolled off Joe's tongue, but I, yeah, I don't know. They, they need to buy a vowel. <laughs> All right, um, so what does it look like? So what the proposed standard looks like is a YAML file. So those of you who are familiar with YAML um, and ActivitySim, another uh, open source effort uses YAML extensively. It's a, a markup language. So what we have are, are different fields and for those fields there's details that take action. So in this case, I'm showing a roadway diet um, right outside Met Council's offices. So we name the project, and this name is a string. Uh, the type of edit we're making is the category. So there's different categories that the current software that we wrote to support this implements, which I'll discuss briefly. You can give any number of tags to the project cards, and the, the software allows you to sort those tags. So you can have tags like um, existing plus committed, or regional plan 2020, or uh, project X and all the project cards uh, associated with those tags can be assembled into what we call a scenario. There's a list of dependencies. So these dependencies are prerequisites, co-requisites, and conflicts. So a prerequisite means that this project needs to have a previous project in order to be included. So if you're going to build uh, you know, a transit service, that transit service may need to have the rail line in place. Or if you're going to uh, add an express lane, you may need to widen the freeway. There's a co-requisite, which means this project has to be included with another project. And then there's a conflict. So you may have a roadway widening project and also a roadway diet. And if those conflict, they can't be included in the same scenario. And the project card gives you a, a path through that. In terms of the detail of the edit, the facility here, uh, there's a number of ways in which you can select links. You can use roadway names, you can use OSM IDs, kind of anything in the database. And in this case, we select out the link with an ID as well as, a, as an A and B node to confirm what we're talking about. And then we can change the properties of that facility. So in this case, we're reducing the number of lanes from three uh, down by one. Uh, so the existing allows us to make sure we're editing what we think we're editing. Another example is improving transit service. So the project carving uh, supports both uh, roadway and transit, which is another shortcoming of some of the existing solutions. So here, the same idea, but here we're selecting in the facility, we're selecting all the express buses. So any, any route in our database that has express in its long name, we're changing its headway expressed in seconds uh, to 30 minutes or 1800 seconds. So we can edit uh, transit uh, or roadway. The standard at this point also has the ability to draw a parallel managed lane for you. So a common problem in travel modeling is we wanna have an explicit representation of a managed lane to get our network assignment algorithm to work properly, but we don't really wanna code it and maintain it because that's tedious and annoying. So in this case, we are selecting uh, just an example link uh, on I-35 East and we are changing its lanes between six and nine a.m. from three to two, and then we're adding a managed lane from zero to one, so one managed lane from six to nine, and we are giving it a price of a dollar fifty, and we are allowing cars to access it and egress it at all the connection points um, between the main line and the uh, managed lane. So the the idea here is that you've got your network and you let the project card and software take care of, of writing managed lanes for you. And uh, once you do an assignment, you can knit those back into the, the general purpose lane and you never have to look at a, a parallel link again, which would be nice. Right now, um, as part of that council project, we refactored some software that uh, SFCTA, uh, Billy and Elizabeth uh, and Lisa Zorn created a while ago and Joe and his team have been supporting 
ever since called Network Wrangler. So pretty much all the ideas incorporated in the software and the project card are, are taken derived from, from those efforts. We've just tried to uh, add a little bit more structure around how the network edits are made. So right now the software supports changing the properties of a roadway, like I showed, adding or removing a roadway, adding a property, uh, changing the characteristics of a transit service and adding parallel managed lanes. And the idea would be that uh, this covers probably 99% of our needs, but if, if there's other type of network edits we make, we could add a category to the software and make the software fairly easy to maintain because these categories can be somewhat uh, autonomous in terms of the actions they take on the network. Uh, I'm assuming we'll share these slides. So uh, if we do, here's some resources. So the project card is defined in a schema, a formal schema defined in JSON. So that's where its uh, definition lives and it can be validated against uh, that definition. The Network Rango 2.0 software is available there and that's what implements the uh, project cards with against the network standard that uh, CJA uh, described and hopefully in the future against a GMNS. And there's also a software package called Lasso, which right now translates the network standards that CJA described into cube format, which is the uh, uh, software that the Met Council uh, uses. In terms of governance and sustainability, we're just getting started. So I think right now we're showing you guys, is this something that we think the community should sustain and develop? Uh, do we think it's a good idea? If so, we'd love to formalize that and uh, start discussing it with the commercial uh, software vendors if, if they were interested and hopefully move it forward. And that's all I've got then, but thank you all very much for your time and attention. Look forward to the discussion. Cool, thank you. Great introduction to a lot of exciting projects. So what I want to do next is um, put some slide, a slide up here with um, some questions. And I want to make sure people can see my screen. Hold on, share my screen. OK, oh, and I guess move these. We'll put those there. I don't know, is that weird? Can you see those? Can you see my Zoom window of people also? Yeah, OK. <laughs> Um, okay, so first of all, any questions just about different topics, um, you know, specific details or follow-ups, and then we have a number of questions to kind of encourage us along in conversation, but it can definitely be more organic. So let's start with audience questions. Or maybe there isn't any. <laughs> It may be, everybody may be muted then. Everybody's be muted, but they can actually unmute themselves. So feel free to unmute yourself. Okay. I can't see the chat when I go full screen, but I might be able to if I. Then I have a question for the GMNS group, um, maybe to get us started. One of, the, one of the requirements that Scott mentioned was that the network standard be human readable. I thought that was interesting. Why, why do you guys think it's important for a network to be readable by a human as opposed to a computer? I, I'm thinking that more as, as uh, to people, this is Scott, uh, people I think typically get started with the tiny toy network in, in terms of learning the standard. So, it, so at this point for just basic validation we wanted we wanted to have the barrier to entry as low as possible and a csv file is about as low as you can get in terms of somebody being able to read it with tools that anyone has yeah it's interesting i had the same question um do you imagine maybe having the standard support both a an open, like a text file format and a binary format or a more compact or efficient version for large networks? Uh, we, had not, we, had not we had not seriously considered that yet, uh, but I could see it going in that direction if needed, although I think I found from experience, it's like unlike the matrices, uh, the networks tend to be of manageable size. We've done some experiments, like looking at well-known text for the geometries. 
so it has not been an urgent thing for us, unlike, say, you might want to do with skims. <laughs> yeah, if I can just maybe add on to that. You know, I mentioned yeah. uh, early on that one of the first things that the uh, project management group or committee did was to kind of determine a set of kind of high level um, or, or a set of kind of requirements for the project uh, or for the specification or standard. And um, human readable was one of the, you know, 10 or so uh, requirements that were kind of established early on. And I can, I'll send a link in the chat box to that document on the project um, uh, repository, uh, because each one, there's a little bit of an explanation about why these particular requirements were adopted. Um, if I may, I would also like to chime in on OMX. Uh, our, uh, the people at the beginning who were working on it, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of concern that we were building a, a format that was not human readable. Uh, and for our use case, we were trying to provide a matrix format that was uh, not necessarily a drop-in replacement for the, the, the vendor supplied matrices uh, from the commercial packages, but that served a very similar purpose, which was that they were uh, something that you could use in your workflow and not necessarily was it something that uh, humans needed to read all the time. Uh, but we had the exact same discussion about whether it was worthwhile to have a human readable version of OMX uh, instead of this HDF5 binary blob where you need an API in order to read it. But we had a very different use case. So I just wanted to put that out there, that the use case does make a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question um, to, I guess, all the groups. Uh, in terms of uh, metadata, um, there's also, I think, a very, very strong need for a standard around metadata to drive <clears throat> networks, matrices, everything you want to talk about here. Uh, how much work has been done on that and where do your projects stand in terms of that? Um, I'll start again. Uh, the, the OMX format, uh, you can add any sort of metadata properties to the files. Um, what the format specifies is things that must be in a file for it to count as OMX. Yeah but it doesn't preclude you adding additional fields and other information. Um, those things are not uh, mandatory, uh, but if uh, your agency or your use case said, hey, we want to attach some, some data to these files in addition to the standard things, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. And for the project, and this is, oh, for you, this is Scott, just for GMNS, one thing, uh, we decided early on was that all, all the files, you would have the capability to add optional fields depending on your particular need. So that the list of required fields would be kept as small as possible. And for the project card, the support of metadata is kind of not the entire purpose, but a large share of the purpose. So you can add tags, you can add notes, you can add prerequisites and co-requisites. So it kind of is the standard kind of is metadata with a little bit of network edit detail in there. Sorry, yeah. Suji, go ahead. I'll um, add on for the railway standard network that we proposed. Um, there, right now, um, the attributes that are in the links file is mostly um, derived from OSM. Um, but of course, if there's any um, necessary attributes that we think should be added into those standard attribute set, it's also very fully freely to add in because it's um, essentially just a JSON file. And then we also developed um, schemas to validate those um, network standards, which we could also add those additional attributes to the schema for the validation. I found um, that CJ, your presentation real interesting because you were asking to have us agree to use OSM and GTFS as the foundation for our work and then also uh, specifying a standard in a way sort of um, kind of like a model network or open source derived standard. So, you know, my question about naming it, um, 
you can't really name the beginning of it, right? But but like but that's an interesting thing is is kind of how how do we think about trying to get us to all agree to do something that way? Does creating a standard named link node shape thing that is derived from those sufficient enough to get the, the upstream thing to happen? Because it'll be just so wonderful, I will just want to use OpenStreetMap and GTFS. Or is there work, and I guess there's probably work to do around getting us as a community to use those two hugely useful resources. Can you comment on the difference or the similarities about those two exercises? Um, I think, I think the question is rather like if we have a mature pipeline for anyone to arrive from the OSM and GTFS to those um, network standard that we proposed. And that's what we've been working on throughout the process with um, my council. And also we're gonna be continue working on with other agencies. Um, right now we have some standard um, Python scripts built to achieve that. Um, and I think the real difference is um, lies in like um, how the other um, GIS inputs from like a different MPO would would affect um, my end result. And that would be also taken care of by um, the tools that we developed for the conflation, that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I would also add that, um, you know, a lot of the challenge is that a lot of, a lot of travel models kind of rely on either a legacy network they put a lot of work in and they feel really good about that may not be aligned with a modern base map. So, and that may also be a function, maybe downstream from a Department of Transportation that has a, a base map that they rely on but isn't aligned with the modern base map. And it kind of puts you in a position where at some point, <laughs> right, at some point to engage in the wider world, you need to, you don't need to, but I think as a community, we would really benefit from engaging in the broader world. And at a minimum, the broader world wants an accurate base map. <laughs> I, think, I think it would be better if we used OSM because that is kind of an open community standard. And if we published our travel model networks that were aligned with OSM, I mean, you can do so many more things with them and the community can engage, the broader community can engage engage with them but there is this kind of phase change a lot of agencies would need to make to go from you know what they have and what they can get to an accurate base map and in some case that's really expensive and there may not be a, a ton of upside in terms of forecasting the upside may be more on the public engagement side which may be you know a luxury to many Hey, this is uh, Joe. I, I guess I have a question uh, uh, to to uh, Seja and and Dave. Um, it did strike me that, um, that that you use the term pipeline. That that really is a whole process that you're talking about. It has elements of what the source data is and standards and you know processes that have to go through. You have to go through. Are those available? Um, for and, and we've talked earlier about you know one of the benefits um, uh, to kind of making these tools available and having data sources that are kind of freely available is the opportunity to kind of learn and collaborate. Can we all access um, the work that you have done for Met Council and kind of take a look at it and potentially pick up and run with it ourselves? Is my first question. And are there other um, regions that maybe you guys are working with um, that are also looking to kind of build on the Met Council experience and, and how, how at this point, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, uh, uh, complete is that process or is, are there still elements of it that are, are um, uh, more laborious? Yeah, it's a great question, Joe. You want to go ahead? Dave, and... you want to go first? <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. Um, so in terms of the, the way we tried to structure it was that Network Wrangler managed networks, engaged with uh, project cards in read and write to open standard formats, GeoJSON, JSON, hopefully GMNS uh, in the long run. Um, and then we have a companion package called Lasso, which we tried to put all of the 
the dirty work um, in it in terms of reading and you know going from the standard network to cube, building those networks, doing the conflation. Lasso is open source; it's available. Um, it's probably fifty percent of where we'd want it to be. Um, you know, it does rely on you know shared streets, which is a great idea, but maybe not quite that mature. OSM and X, which is a great idea and is mature. So there is kind of an open source stack that it that it relies on that's got a pretty big user base and getting bigger. Um, so we're optimistic about it. Um, we are, do anticipate uh, beginning an engagement with MTC in the Bay Area to improve the stack and also uh, rebuild that their network. The, the tedious challenging part is conflating other base layers into OSM. If you're conflating you know, Tom, Tom, or here, or an accurate map, the conflation is more or less trivial because they align. But if you're conflating, conflating a, a centerline file from a DOT that that's they haven't need to needed to update, you know, that can start to be a more laborious process. And that's kind of what I was saying about that that phase change of being like, okay, we're going to go to a modern base map. And I think our our big idea would be, hey, when you do that, you should really consider OSM you know, to connect with the community. I know that's something that you guys at SFCTA have done to connect your network to OSM to say, hey, here's at least some crosswalk from the world we live in to the world that, that other people engage in. Is there, um, you know, giving, contributing back to OSM, right? When you find issues or you want to create new stuff. It sounds great. We should do it. <laughs> How hard is it? What's the, been the experience? I'm sure that's come up in the conversation. Yeah, I know for sure. Um, so we've we've punted on it for now. I mean, what we what we're trying to do is all the fixes we're making to the OSM source for Met Council we're putting in project cards. So we've got an audited trace of of what we did. Um, then I think we're I think the question then becomes, okay, do we want to go the extra mile of of re-uploading fixes that that we think need to be made uh, back to OSM, and then not, on the other challenge is like number of lanes and things like that that you may be getting from proprietary sources or may not feel is necessarily maybe it's accurate enough for your travel model. You know, if there's a two-lane road in rural Minneapolis, rural Minnesota, you know, guessing that it's two lanes is probably good for the travel model, but is that something you want to upload to OSM? you know, how, how confident you are in the, in the edits is, yeah. So I think I would say it sets the stage to make that contribution, but yeah, the details of making that contribution is, is non-trivial. And I do wanted to point out that um, OSM attributes are not always available for every link, especially for like lower class um, facilities. Like we would definitely see a lot of missing number of lanes saying, a lot of like residential streets and those are where we um, struggled and then got additional information from the other databases that um, Met Council gave us. Um, and as said, we included those information in the base network and we have yet to um, return that back to OSM asking them to add it or not. Uh, this is Rosella Picado. I was wondering if you are all talking not just about it, the, the data standard itself, but also standard on what should be included in a highway network for modeling purposes, like, you know, a little bit to the point that CJ just made. Um, are we all, you know, are we moving towards including all streets or are we including only up to principal arterials? Is there enough information in the original sources to make that decision sort of programmatically without spending a lot of time then having to pick which facilities get selected and how does this interface then with the zonal level of detail? Um, or is that so a completely that, separate topic? So. Um, I think the network standards should be applied to um, all the facilities or the links and nodes that you wanted to include in your um, modeling network. And again, the effort of getting those, all the attributes for each link correct is, um, is, is large, is big. Um, and then we 
absolutely like couldn't get everything from the data sources. So we had to come up with certain algorithms to infer uh, a lot of attributes based on some other available attributes. For example, like your number of lanes can be inferred based on like your area type or like your facility type, etc. cetera. Um, so that's something like we need to really um, improve or think about when we are trying to implement this um, network standard for a larger scope. Uh, can I, oh, this is Scott, can uh, I also like you know, respond to that is, uh, you know, one, one thing I think we had to give a lot of thought to in GMNS was the multi-resolution aspect of it where you wanted to go everything from a statewide model where all you have are nodes and links down to say, you know, side sidewalks in a small area of the city. Uh, so I'd say uh, is, you know, the, 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 this is where the thought goes into it. I think just doing nodes and links is it's fairly straightforward. Um, and, but then handling the multi-resolution aspect and having the flexibility to go between one and the other is, is actually a bit more of a challenge. So we're at about a half hour to go. So let's go through a few questions. Um, I think we've talked about a lot of interesting things today. One of the things I'm interested in is what we're not talking about. So is there um, any other standards or opportunities do you think that we, we should be using in our industry? This is Dave, I would suggest, um, you know, we all have SOCHEC data. We all name things slightly different, TAZ, zone underscore ID, ID, capital TAZ. No reason we couldn't standardize that. Um, many of us have activity-based models that have trip files, tour files, activity files. We could standardize those names. That could also be standardizing household survey names, standardizing onboard survey names, anything we could do to, you know, to standardize the uh, inputs and outputs, you know, just make developing tools much easier. That can get messy, but all else equal, if we just, if we're all doing the same thing, <laughs> You know, it seems we could at least start with the same name and build from it. I put those out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely like the idea of um, a standard household travel survey format. You know, an extensible <laughs> growing household travel survey specification. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that's something that we have been talking about as part of, um, you know, eight agencies presently are collaborating on the activity sim project, which, which Ben is also leading, uh, that's really trying to develop kind of a common activity-based modeling platform um, uh, that is both, you know, kind of has a kind of shared core, uh, but also allows people to, you know, um, uh, implement region-specific or, you know, implementation-specific refinements or customizations. But something that keeps coming up on that is, uh, and it's, it is, there's a tension, it's, that go that is between both wanting to keep things uh, generic, but also wanting to allow people to have the flexibility to customize. But the household travel surveys, uh, the data structures itself, um, you know, are so you know common across so many of these different implementations. Um, I think it it goes. So I think there's tremendous value in that, and I think that's something that we're going to continue to explore in that project, or at least I would like to. Um, you know, it, it's. It does require, it's, it starts with a name, but it's, you, you, you have to enforce more than just a naming convention. It's also making sure that, you know, what we're talking about, what, we're, what we are naming is actually the same thing. Um, so it's not to say that it will be easy, but I think that there's tremendous benefits that we can derive from starting to standardize on these things. Um, and again, like really lowering the barriers um, and the costs and the resource requirements for people to leverage other folks's um, um, developments and improvements. Are there standards that we're not using? We, we talked about OSM, GTFS, shared streets. Is there anything else that jumps out to anybody? Uh, 
Well, in the chat box, there's been a discussion about GTFS ride, um, which is uh, you know kind of a standard for transit um, ridership data uh, as a complement to GTFS. We actually haven't started to use it, but I, I think that's another example of um, uh, uh, you know a standard that's out there that we could all benefit from. Okay. How about governance questions? You know, the evolution and management of standards. I think Dave, you, you said uh, governance, question mark, we're just getting started. <laughs> so what are some of the things <laughs> that you're, you're thinking about, you know, to kick off this question, some of the questions you're wondering about? Um, I would, I mean, I'd love to hear from any of the commercial software vendors if, if, if they're on about how they would like us to engage them, if they would like us to engage them and how we could, uh, you know, improve the project card uh, in this case, you know, to make sure it's, it's useful. I think one of the success stories of OMX is, is engaging and working with the commercial vendors to make sure that it's, it's compatible because it's not something that, you know, we're not proposing it as something better. We're just conserving as, you know, proposing as something interoperable. So I think that's the first step, make sure that the professional software developers in our community um, have an opportunity to to comment and things we can and, and teach us some things because they've been doing this for a long time. And then I think the second thing is, you know, some some place for it to live. I think the the GMNS, you know, having been part of Zephyr, Zephyr and then getting the support from FHWA and Scott and Volpe, you know, that's that's terrific, you know, particularly that it started from, I think, Lisa Zorn's <laughs> Shark Tank uh, thing, thing from so long ago. I mean, that's, that's pretty neat that we've, we've come this far in terms of organizing ourselves and, and working together. Um, and I guess the third thing would be, you know, just to thank Met Council and allowing them to, you know, it's more expensive to try to do stuff in standardized ways and it's, it's more work. Um, and being community minded in that way is really hard when you're at a public agency and under funding constraints and you know might be seen as a luxury, but I think in the long run it benefits all of us. And obviously there's many MPOs and state DOTs who've, who've been contributing to that. So those are the, I guess those are the three things that I would I would like to do next. So engage the commercial vendors, see if there's a place where it can live and and uh, you know express gratitude at every opportunity for the public sector agencies that that fund these things. So I, I can tackle the, the first point, Dave. Um, <clears throat> but you have to call us a developer, not a vendor. That's the first thing. I think point seven on the slide looks great. Um, uh, look, you know, uh, I'm kidding. Right now, you can tell, I mean, there are representatives from some of the commercial tool developers in a whole bunch of Zephyr working groups right now. Uh, we've got two in ours, Dave. I, I know there's two in another one. Uh, I, I certainly, I'm sure there's more. Uh, if we look at how OMX has developed, I think probably, and, and Ben can tell us, and Billy can tell us, but I'm sure that the first wave of feedback and bugs and uh, all kinds of uh, improvements, community-driven, were from commercial tool developers. So I think we are involved, and, and certainly I feel involved, uh, and, and I'm sure that my, my colleagues and, and other firms do as well. I think that OMX was a, was a wonderful example because everybody, at least that's how I see it, uh, felt that, that it was a clearly articulated proposal uh, with um, a, a clear value proposition to just about everyone. And so, you know, I, I think that, you know, certainly there's, there's a, a network effect. The more support is, is adopted uh, and provided, the more it will continue to grow. But I, I think that's, that's the, the poster child. I think that, um, a lot of them, I mean, I listened to all the network standards discussion today. I think they're all good discussions. There are some problems we have to solve there. Uh, I think there's some, you know, some competition about, you know, how is the best way to represent network standards. And I think we should allow these things to, to evolve organically uh, and, and see when they're, when they're mature enough. I, I think it becomes an organic proposition. At least that's how I see it. I mean, if you really feel that uh, maybe there's a couple lines we can see coming on certain things that might be contentious and based on the different, you know, stakeholders in Zephyr, how they affect us all differently, then maybe we need something, um, you know, some mechanism in place. But for now, I, I'm optimistic enough to think that, you know, 
once there's a clear value proposition demonstrated, it's certainly uh, the, the users of the tools feel that there's a value proposition. I'm going to be optimistic and say, I, I don't see necessarily a, a barrier yet. I don't know if you feel differently, you can let, let us know. No, I, I, I didn't mean to imply at all that you guys would be a barrier. I think it's on us as the people with the idea to make sure we reach out from you and, you know, and learn from you before we, uh, you know, as we, as it grows. Can, can I just uh, add in at the beginning of OMX, we, we knew we were onto something uh, from the very beginning and we were hopeful it would be successful, but it wasn't guaranteed. And having the buy-in from the vendor, sorry, the commercial software developers was uh, an obvious thing that had to happen for this thing to be successful. Like we weren't going to be successful if we went around them or built some other format that was totally incompatible. We needed the commercial software developers at the table with us. Uh, and so that really affected how we sort of, not just the design of the file format, but like how we went about uh, proselytizing this at TRB and the license that we chose for the code, um, you know, and the, the amount of handholding and feedback that we gave and also that, you know, the feedback that we listened to uh, from the vendors, it was really key. I think the, uh, the all next thing was probably the easiest of these different challenges because it was such an obvious need and the, the technical solution, looked, you know, it sort of emerged rather quickly. Uh, I definitely think things like network standards are, are harder and that's why um, we're tackling them next. Can I add, uh, uh, Billy, Dave, uh, I'm at the risk of belaboring the point, and there's one thing I want to add. You know, um, when we get to the idea of something really maturing to the point of having, you know, a validation for the specification, like um, Ben just bravely coded up for the OMX uh, project uh, after we identified this in the Badger group. But, you know, it's, it's also the tool developers, not just the commercial ones, who are going to have to contend with supporting all these specifications in practice. And, and that's really another loop. Like, it, you know, we all have, I suppose, a different uh, role in the ecosystem. And, when it actually comes down to interoperability of the standards and things working or not, uh, anyone who's a tool developer, commercial or otherwise, you know, if they're supporting their tool, is going to have to get involved and contribute at that level too. So, you know, uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe questions two and three are are ready to to be considered, but I think one is is fine for now. You know, I, I guess I'd like to maybe ask a a question generally, but maybe specifically picking up and directed back at something, Billy, that you just said a moment ago, which was, you, you know, you kind of, I don't remember exactly what you said, but something to the effect of, you know, um, we had to buy and then it was just a matter of getting, you know, the technology right. And it feels to me like with a lot of the other presentations that we've talked about, that that's something that really distinguishes OMX in some way is that it really is a, a technology solution and many of the other specifications or, were sta or standards that we're talking about aren't really necessarily about a technology it's it's more about um i don't know what the right i can't try to think of what the right word is but like a, a methods or content or you know kind of ways of doing things and it feels like that presents a different set of challenges and i was wondering if anybody has had that same kind of feeling and, and to you specifically billy when you think about like i noticed you had your mat sim t-shirt on so ben actually we got a budget for activity sim t-shirts for phase six we got, That's um, right. Right. But, uh, but do you consider something like MATSIM a, a standard in some way or just a tool? Because it's in, in a way, it's, it's kind of a little bit closer to some of the stuff that we're trying to deal with in GMNS, not fully. Uh, I think MATSIM is really a platform. Uh, it's not a standard at all. Um, the, the platform supports lots of different types of analyses and it manages data inputs from lots of different ecosystems and different formats. But it's really sort of one ecosystem on its own. Uh, I certainly don't think it's a standard uh, at all. I think it's just a, it's a sort of different beast than that. What was your second? What was that? Was a long question. What was the, the second half? I felt like there was. Right. There. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> it was the idea that like OMX, you referred to it as kind of like finding a technology solution, and yet many of the other standard discussions that we've been talking about aren't really about a particular. They're not limited to a particular oh, technology. I, th I think I actually disagree on that. I think that OMX, there, we identified there was a gap, there was a need for uh, improved interoperability 
between the different packages that were out there and also just so that agencies could share their data uh, with people who weren't modelers, you know, so that uh, statisticians or interested citizens could download data and put it into their R scripts and make cool blog entries about the, you know, the data. Um, I actually think that the network stuff is an identical problem where this is something that uh, having our industry cut up into separate shards based on which commercial software developer they've, you know, chosen for a, a contract building a model means that we can't collaborate together. And our industry is too small for us to be working in little silos. And so I think the network standard really is the second, it's really chapter two, it's the second half of, of this process of trying to get these data standards uh, generated in a way that we, that we can work together. And not at all to the detriment of the commercial software developers. I think just like OMX, uh, there's room for this sort of interchange format uh, that works with the vendors, not against them. Yeah, I, I really like that point. I think that um, the lack of a collaborative standard speaks to the immaturity, in a way, of the industry. <laughs> because, you know, you think about the shapefile. You know, one of the things we talked about when we started OMX was like, you know, there used to be GIS before the shapefile. It's like almost impossible to think of it, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, that maybe there will, you know, there are just some differences in the network standards. And that's part of the exercise that we're going through right now is, as an industry, is kind of trying to agree what a network standard should be. You know, maybe we do nodes and links a little different, or we do intersections and turns and signal timing for DTA. You know, we're not... We're not re we don't really have a critical mass yet for any of that. Everyone's doing it a little different. And, and so really growing and becoming, I think, something incredible as an industry is going to take that consolidation and uh, definition together of, of something like a, like a network standard, a shapefile or something. OK. I'll go on to the next question. I silenced everybody with that statement. <laughs> Can't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, another thing you said, Dave, was uh, I'm kind of on question five still. Um, applauding agencies that fund doing sta work via standards is more expensive and also, you know, a great way to do things. I think that funding these projects is tricky. And I always think that maybe we need more grants or, you know, like Zephyr Awards or things like kind of sort of separate a bit from contracts and projects that are a little more community granty kind of vibe. Does anybody have any ideas or thoughts about trying to encourage standards via other instruments? I love that idea. I mean, I think two things. I think, um, I think that was one of the original motivators for Zephyr, right? That we could have the potential to go get out and grants and spend it with a potential freedom that FHWA and TRB and others don't, don't always have. Um, and number two, I think the Activity Sim Consortium is a great example of, a little bit self-serving for me to say that, but for MPOs coming together, right? To say, okay, we do have this common problem that if we all contribute a little bit, we can solve better than any of us taking this on as one. So I think that's a, a really interesting model. Yeah, if you folks might be familiar with NumFocus, which is a like an organization for scientific software, open source scientific mm -hmm. software that does grants and supports a number of projects and um, you know, it's a much bigger umbrella they're in. Uh, but I, I do like the work that they're doing and it feels relevant to the work we're trying to do. You could imagine like a Zephyr program where if you if you're doing a project, you could apply for a grant to get an additional, you know, 20, 30, 50 K to to try to do it in a more standardized way or do it by adopting the standard or something. That'd be I mean, a lot of fundraising and organizational management for us on the Zephyr side to do before we get there, but that would be that'd be great. Are there are there any additional benefits of, of standards that we haven't talked about? Um, I would go 
So the network standard that based on OSM is good in a way that it keeps or contains the OSM IDs, which we can later on use it if we wanted to, for example, update to a 2020 network instead of like a 2012 network. So we could use that to easily join it back with the old OpenStreetMap server and extract more mm -hmm. updated information. Yeah, it's 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 mostly how like we can um, organically reuse those um, network standard with time going on with all the base sources being updated. So I think yeah. OSM and GTFS are a great start because they are regularly updated and open source. Yeah. Thank you. This is Scott. Um, I think one thing I'll add is that at the outset on GMNS, we started by looking at a whole number of existing standards and practices. Uh, so, including OSM. So, in fact, uh, yes, we, we've also taken a look at OSM and shared streets, and we rather quickly concluded that GTFS was doing a pretty good job of the transit end of things. Uh, so I think that you know this evolution is organically occurring, but I think what's important is to do what we can to reduce the barriers to entry uh, via good documentation. I'll give you an example. I ended up kind of accidentally introducing a an MPO to OMX, and it was those APIs and examples that enabled me to climb that learning curve. Uh, simply because, hey, we had an interchange issue. We didn't have their modeling software and we needed to read their matrices. Uh, so I think by reducing those barriers to entry that and then when the need arises, people can hop over that lower barrier and then you've got a new user and more, and more fuel for the standard. Okay. Um, we're going to jump over seven. Dan, I think you nailed that yeah. one earlier. So, uh, yeah. Um, so w let's talk about barriers, Scott. You just said barriers. Um, standards are awesome. Everybody loves standards. You know, that's what we've been saying. Why aren't we using them more? What are the issues? Please share, especially agency, you know, folks in agencies or in projects and things. Nobody? <laughs> uh, all right, this is Scott. I'll jump in again. Well, one thing is simple lack of awareness. Uh, that it even exists and might be helpful to your problem. Okay, so we need more outreach and marketing. <laughs> yeah. I think part of it is that a lot of times when you're doing sort of rapid model development slash updates, um, the idea of having having a standard that you're adhering to is nice, but then you know somebody asks you to add some feature and you add some feature and then your standard is and then you've divert diverged from the standard. So I think that's a common occurrence. Mark, you uh, are on mute. You want to say something? Oh, I was just going to say that um, we tried using OMX uh, within Cube and uh, found that the files were much bigger and much slower to develop, you know, when you're running the model, so it slowed the model runtime. So, you know, one of the things is we get a lot of data requests each year, probably 60 or 70 request for our travel demand model or the inputs to the model. And sometimes people don't have the software that we're using, which is currently Cube. And so they say, oh, can you create this in a different format? So we thought, oh, well, if we could just save the files out in OMX format, that would do it. But it, it technically worked, but it just, it took a long time to basically write the file. So we said to ourselves, well, we're not gonna just make OMX the new standard for the model because it will run too slow. Yes, we could export to that and then send it to people. But so that's one thing that sort of discouraged us from using it more. 
And so maybe we should think about improvements, you know, some more functionality in the uh, specification for performance or other things. Yeah, it could, it could be related to the way that um, Cube implemented that standard. I don't know, just we did a quick test and it, it, it ran a long time. We we're like, eh, nah, skip it. It's good feedback. Okay. Um, and I think part of the reason is also just lack of um, comfort with the tools or the programming languages in which they're written. I mean, you guys here are essentially the cream of the crop, right? Um, but the vast majority of people that are working with these models, um, they, they just don't know how to handle, um, you know, what you guys are producing without a lot of handholding. That's why we got Dan here. He's got, he's got that M community helping us out, building good tools. We tried to break that barrier at PSRC uh, with our blog. Um, can I just show just really quickly, if you don't mind, this is an old post from a couple of years ago, uh, but this was on the data blog where uh, you know, on the internet at PSRC's website, it was like, hey, we have these trip tables. What are they? How do you look at them? Um, you know, like what is here? And it's a very nerdy sort of uh, um, blog post full of jargon and stuff, but it's a, sort of a how-to, uh, complete with like an example of how you would get the data out of one of these OMX files and use it to look at bike trips in Seattle. Um, Something, Billy? Oh no, it says that I'm sharing my screen. Can you not see it? Um, sorry about that. Let's there try that. I'm going to try again. Boom, boom. How about now? Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's not much more to say. It's a, it's a, you know, one blog post from a long time ago, but the idea here was that we were trying to uh, not just use it internally, but broadcast that these files were available, uh, that, you know, there was just a few steps for anybody on the internet who had a computer to download this stuff, you know, and take a look, uh, you know, with an example on how to do it. I have no idea if anyone in the Seattle region actually downloaded this file <laughs> like that. I don't know, uh, but that was one thing that we did try to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the question of training and the technical capabilities, both of staff, but also of the, the general public. I mean, that's something that we're always fighting in our industry for sure. All right. Well, that brings us to the end. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have some more Zephyr uh, panels and uh, sessions later this summer. Um, Elizabeth, do you uh, want to share anything about the upcoming sessions? And then we also have a link uh, to uh, feedback. Anything to add, Elizabeth? I'll just say that the Machine Learning 101, which was just open for, um, which is a two-day session, which was just open for members until this week um, is now open for everybody to register. All right. And if you guys have any questions, uh, you know, feel free to follow up with folks. We'll, we'll post the presentation online and um, the, uh, and the recording. Thank you all so much for participating in this. And I, I certainly learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much.